I'm happy to introduce our next speaker. Uh, David Otter is Ford Professor in the MIT Department of Economics. He's also a co-director of NBER's Labor Studies Program. Uh, he was co-director of MIT's Work of the Future Task Force uh, and co-author of its major report, which really made significant contributions to our understanding of the dynamics between technology advance and work. Uh, you know, frankly, for my money, David is the most insightful labor economist now out there, deeply engaged in the societal implications of the issues that we're talking about today. Uh, don't miss his writing. Uh, he's going to review the reality that U.S. manufacturing employment has lost tremendous ground over the last three decades, um, how the landscape of trade, technology, and public policy have really shifted in more recent years, um, and he's going to discuss how we got to this point and what changes are now underway and what this may mean for the manufacturing workforce in particular. David. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to speak about the labor market for manufacturing. I'm, I'm going to talk about four points. One is uh, how we got to this point uh, related to trade and technology and policy. The second is what is the status of the post-pandemic labor market? Uh, and if you are uh, in the business of hiring, you, you have firsthand experience with this. The third question I want to ask is, are, are manufacturing jobs actually good jobs? Do people, should people even want them? Uh, and, uh, and fourth, I'm going to talk about very briefly kind of what, what I think is going to matter uh, going forward. But let me start with uh, how we got here. So uh, you know, how did we get to mass manufacturing employment? Well, the origin of mass manufacturing employment was the displacement of artisanal labor, right? Artisans are people who make things from start to finish, you know, a bootmaker, a wheelwright, uh, someone who knows all the steps in producing something. And mass production was the brilliant idea of replacing artisans with machines, managers, and typically low-skilled, low-paid labor working under grueling working conditions. So if you go to the original textile mills uh, in, uh, in Manchester, you will see that they were mostly staffed by children who were indentured servants, uh, put into indentured troops to around the age of 10 and kept. If they were lucky, they were, well, they were certainly fed. If they were lucky, they were also educated and given medical care. Uh, why children? Well, uh, the work was unskilled. And it was really helpful to have you know, um, quick reflexes, because when you had to change a bobbin uh, on one of these machines, they couldn't stop the machine. It was hundreds and hundreds of bobbins simultaneously. So you need to work quickly so you didn't lose a finger. Now, they were indentured children, so they lost a lot of fingers. Uh, that was considered acceptable. Um, however, uh, as industry advanced, this changed. Why did it change? Well, the products became much more complicated. The processes became much more complicated. The demands for quality became much more significant. And so you needed workers actually with some expertise, what I'm going to call mass expertise, people who were literate and numerate and could essentially follow rules and master tools. And this notion of what I call mass expertise kind of built a lot of the middle class in the United States from the, uh, throughout most of the 20th century. And not just in manufacturing, but also in offices, people who could carry out skilled tasks that had well-defined boundaries and well-understood rules and required literacy and numeracy and thinking uh, not huge amounts of discretion, but certainly made the skills that people possessed at that time valuable, particularly high school degrees. And uh, the US was way ahead of the curve in sending its entire population to high school. Uh, between the end of the ni late 19th century and the early 20th century, uh, the so-called high school movement mandated that children uh, stay in school to the age of 16 or 18, state by state. In fact, it was led by the farm states. Why was that a big deal? Why was that radical? Well, uh, it was costly. You had to hire teachers. You had to build buildings. You had to buy books. Um, uh, it wasn't clear that everybody needed that elite education. And most importantly, those children couldn't work. They couldn't work on the farms or elsewhere at that time. That was a really big cost. Uh, it turned out to be essential and allowed us to successfully make this transition uh, out of agriculture and into mass production and into services with an educated workforce that's prepared to learn rules and master tools and carry out this skilled but not highly discretionary work uh, that was so central uh, to middle class employment. Um, and so you know, here are two examples, uh, iconic. Right, tool and tie, worker, tie workers, typing workers, et cetera. Uh, 
So this began to change, particularly in the 1980s with the computer revolution. So uh, let me just remind you what is a computer. Uh, let me show you a picture of your first uh, personal computer, uh, the Jacquard Loom of 1801. Uh, you may not have had this particular model. Uh, what makes it a computer is it's a symbolic processor. Uh, it accesses, analyzes, and acts upon information. So these things that you see here are punch cards that have instructions to the loom about what arms to lift, what threads to use, et cetera. In fact, there's a surviving example of 10,000 cards that weaves a picture of Jacquard himself. And this was the inspiration for Herman Holrith, uh, who uh, created the paper punch card, was used to read the 1890 US Census, the first machine read census of populations. And then he joined forces with Thomas Watson to form a company uh, called IBM. So, this, uh, what made this distinct from all prior machines is that you could give it instructions. It could run programs. It could carry out a set of steps logically and fully defined. It didn't have discretion. It didn't have judgment. It didn't, uh, didn't you know, kind of uh, make up the rules as it went along or solve problems. But if you could fully specify the steps, uh, the machine could execute it. And that was remarkable. Uh, what economists call these tasks that fit this description of being fully codifiable as routine or routine codifiable tasks, things that can be specified in programs. Um, and then that was really helped along by a, a significant cost decline. It's estimated that the real cost of computing, of ca carrying out a million stored instructions, fell by over a trillion fold from 1950 to the present. So that creates a lot of economic incentive to figure out, hey, what can we use this for? What things fit this description of routine codifiable tasks that we can have a machine execute instead of an educated person? Um, now, it turns out there's a lot of things that we want to automate that we actually can't automate uh, using these rules and procedures. This is what uh, some call Polanyi's paradox, which is the philosopher Michael Polanyi said, we know more than we can tell. Right? Uh, you, don't, you could not teach your kid to ride a bicycle by standing up on a blackboard and explaining the principles of gyroscopics. Right? You don't understand it, and it wouldn't be useful. <laughs> what you do is you put your kid on the bike, and you push, and you hope for the best. Right? Uh, why? Many things that we learn, we learn through tacit knowledge. And so uh, there are a lot of things that we do that we don't actually know how we do them. Right? So riding a unicycle or telling a joke. Right? Um, these are things that are very hard to computerize traditionally prior to AI because we don't know the rules. Right? So the computer era gave rise to a very particular pattern in the labor market. Many things happened. I'm oversimplifying here, but I think this is important. Um, computerization replaced a lot of that mass expertise, a lot of that uh, learning the rules, mastering the tools. Machines could do those things because although they were skilled activities that required analytical thinking, uh, literacy and numeracy, they could be codified as software. Um, and this led to a lot of this hollowing out of the middle of workers in production and often clerical and administrative support who were doing middle skilled work that was well described by a set of rules and could be automated. And so you ended up with this barbell, uh, middle skilled workers, people with high school education who didn't go on for BAs and MBAs and JDs and MDs and PhDs. Many of them were uh, pushed into personal services, food service, cleaning, security, entertainment, recreation. Now, this is valuable work, right? That includes daycare teachers and crossing guards, like literally life and death occupations. But it's poorly paid, and the reason it's poorly paid is it doesn't require much expertise. It uses generic skill sets that many people possess, and therefore, they don't have a lot of scarcity value in the labor market. It was also highly complementary, by the way, to a elite expertise, people who are making professional decisions about how to care for a, a, a patient, how to design a building, how to architect a piece of software. Well, having access to this computing power, the, you know, the, the thing that, that executes the rules uh, and gives you the data, that increases the value of people who can make good decisions. So this, uh, if you happen to be in this category, which I presume everyone in this room is, uh, these have been a good four decades for you. Okay. Unfortunately, this has this displacement. So, you know, Eric Schmidt, uh, former CEO of, of Alphabet, said, you know, where are those mass experts now? Well, they're either developing apps or they're boxing Amazon orders, right? It's really led to this bifurcation. Okay, so now that brings us, that, that was the how computers and computerization, let me say, it eroded manufacturing employment, it didn't wipe it out, uh, it, and it also facilitated globalization. But there were fewer workers on assembly lines than there would have been because more things could be executed by machines that are following rules. Now let's advance to uh, the most recent 20 years, which uh, many people would refer to as the China trade shock. So just to remind you, China's share of world manufacturing employment increased from essentially zero to more than 20% at present uh, in the course of 30 years. 
And that is a remarkable world historic achievement. Nothing like that has ever occurred. And what's remarkable here is not that China is such a large share of world manufacturing now, because it's a huge resource, technologically advanced, literate country. Uh, of course it would be that big. What's amazing is how fast it marched from nowhere, from a state of perpetual uh, economic and political disarray, to a position of preeminence in such a short period of time. Mostly, that reflects developments within China. Right, under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping, the decision to allow foreign direct investment, to allow hundreds of millions of people to migrate out of relatively unproductive rural agriculture into export zones, uh, the decision to use prices. Um, this was revolutionary from within China. But then something else very important happened, which was the decision in 2000 for the US to give uh, China permanent normal trade relations and then bring it into the World Trade Organization in 2001. And this turned out to be highly, highly consequential. Uh, you can see US manufacturing employment as a share of overall employment has been in decline actually for decades. Um, but there's a drop off here <laughs> when China joins the WTO. There's a further drop off, of course, in the Great Recession. That does not have to do with China. And just to illustrate how dramatic this is, let me just show you the count of people in manufacturing. So you can see that actually the high watermark of US manufacturing in terms of employment was in 1979, when there were 19.4 million manufacturing workers, uh, substantially higher than in 1943, though not as a share of the workforce. That, uh, that was, so over the next two decades, manufacturing employment fell by about 100,000 workers per year, a pretty slow rate of decline. And then between 1999 and 2007, we saw a decline of 3.7 million manufacturing workers, so more than 20% of the manufacturing workforce. And then the Great Recession uh, accelerated that process. And now over the last uh, basically 10 or 12 years, there's been a rebound of about a million workers. So um, the uh, China trade shock was incredibly consequential. Now let me emphasize, Trade works just like the theory says. So here are data from the UK. Uh, this shows you, this is from a paper by my co-author David Dorn and his co-author Peter Level. This shows you in the UK, this is the change in Chinese import exposure, and this is the decline in prices of goods that were more exposed. So for example, shoes, garments, appliances, and jewelry, right, had big increase in Chinese import penetration and big declines in prices. Fish, not many Chinese imports, not much of a decline in price. Now look at employment, right? Looks pretty similar, actually. Big declines in employment in shoes, in garments, uh, in appliances, not that much of a decline in employment in fish, right? So the theory says trade works by finding lower cost producers of goods, and that will lower domestic prices and reduce domestic production of that work. And that's exactly what happened. So we shouldn't be surprised that these two things go, go together. And that, in fact, we gave up a lot of employment and we did get less expensive goods. Unfortunately, that sort of cold comfort for someone who works in those industries, right? No amount of cheaper footwear replace, you know, stands in for not having a job any longer. And manufacturing employment is very geographically concentrated. So the sectors in which China gained strong comparative advantage were labor intensive, low value added sectors initially. So, Shoes, commodity furniture, uh, doll assembly, uh, plastics. Uh, if, you, you know, if you happen to wear a plastic raincoat and uh, high heels and carry a Barbie doll, uh, you're basically uh, you're, you're, you're fully using Chinese products. Um, and, and that's important because if this was uniformly geographically distributed, right, you know, three or four million jobs, that's you know, 1,000 or 1,500 workers per US county. But of course, that's not the way it works because where manufacturing occurs, it occurs in a very focused way, right? Some places are in furniture and fixtures. Some places are in games and toys. Some games places are in sporting and athletic goods. And so the China shock was acutely felt in the South, uh, in the South, the, the South Atlantic, uh, the Deep South, and a little bit on the Northeast, a little bit on the West Coast, but not nearly so much. And this had pretty devastating effects. Uh, where it occurred. So this just give you an example of uh, West Hickory, North Carolina, the so-called furniture capital of the world. The percent of working age adults in manufacturing fell from 34% to 15% between 1999 and 2018. The percent of adults working at all fell from 55% to 43%. Government transfers increased a lot. I could give you many such examples, um, but the main point being that the reason this was so painful is it was so focal, 
right? This was not a few, this was not workers, if, you know, a few grocery store workers in every town. These were entire industries that suddenly became non-viable and often were the anchors of the towns in which they were located. Now, looking forward, the China trade shock as we understood it is over. So the period you could think of 1991 to 2000 is the initiation of the shock. This is Chinese import penetration in the United States. I'm here, I'm adding in Southeast Asia. There was this incredible intensification uh, between 2001 and 2010. At a certain point, 8% of all US manufactured goods that we were consuming were being produced in China. And then it has stabilized in the interim. Right? So why is it stabilized? Well, many things have changed. A lot of things have changed in China. China's productivity growth has slowed. There's a lot of reallocation uh, of investment from the private sector to state-run enterprises. And of course, there's now increasingly a lot of fear around too much innovation. So we should understand that we're in a period uh, uh, and where US manufacturing has rebounded that is, uh, we're, we're in a different era. And it's not an era of rising cheap goods. It's much more around frontier goods. Right? It's about electric cars, it's about telecommunications, it's about aircraft, uh, it's no longer about you know, textiles and shoes. We long for those days. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, that's where, how we got to where we are. Let me just very briefly detour for the Trump tariffs. Uh, and at this point, you could call them the Biden tariffs as well. Let's be clear, right? Uh, Biden inherited them. Uh, he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, put them, he didn't, he didn't retire them. So really, they are the Trump-Biden tariffs at present. Um, they were very uh, <laughs> unusual in their nature. So here's import tariff exposure, the places that were most exposed, the darker red colors. Here is the, where the retaliatory tariffs landed. They were not where the, uh, they were not in the same places. They were directed at places uh, where uh, Trump was seen as vulnerable. So China uh, had, a, had a, you know, was, you could think of these as a kind of a, a pinpoint attack. And then there were some farm subsidies that were put in, and those were not at all correlated <laughs> where the trade shock occurred. So uh, economically, this was not successful as far as we can measure it today. Uh, import tariffs did not boost employment, but retaliatory tariffs did reduce it. Now, maybe over the longer run, that will change. You know, it, there could, you know, the US manufacturing investment's increasing. Maybe this is adding to it. Not at all clear. One irony, though, is it did benefit the Republican Party. So the places. Uh, that had the largest exposure uh, uh, to the trade war also had the largest increase in support for Republican candidates uh, on a variety of measures. Why is that? Well, I think most people uh, understand that this didn't, this didn't change the world for them. It didn't reverse the flow of the tide or cause the moon to rise on the other side of the planet or something. However, it did express solidarity, right? It was a, it was a, a political act, and people understood it as such. So uh, I think workers felt legitimately like someone was hearing their grievances. OK, so that brings us to the present. Uh, manufacturing is now in a different place. We are in a different stage, place strategically. And we are also in a very different place demographically. And the challenge of the present is labor scarcity. And manufacturers are feeling this acutely. I'm sure uh, many of you know that firsthand. US population growth is now the slowest since the nation's founding and is not projected to increase. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, one is we have very low fertility rates, like most all industrialized countries, right? So smaller cohorts entering. Uh, we have dramatically restricted immigration, self-destructively in my view. And then of course, this is not about population growth, but we have large retiring populations, right? Uh, the, uh, the baby boomers actually have worked longer than any generation and continue to work a lot, actually. Um, nevertheless, uh, they are retiring, and that creates a fiscal challenge in terms of uh, uh, covering their costs with the current workforce that is not growing quickly. Um, one of those consequences of that is the unemployment rate actually has been falling since 2010, right? Uh, and great, seven minutes, I'm good for that. Uh, has been falling since 2010. It was hitting historic lows in the later years of the Trump administration. The Trump economy was a good economy from the perspective of blue-collar blue workers. Um, when we saw the pandemic, we thought, we'll never get back to where we were, but lo and behold, we're, we're back there and better now. Uh, in fact, the labor market for uh, black Americans has never been stronger as far as we can measure it. The gap in unemployment rates, uh, the rate of wage growth, the rate of movement into higher skill jobs. Um, employment rates are rising, actually, 
among older adults. So for example, if you look at people 75 plus, their employment rate has doubled uh, since 1995. Now, it's doubled from 5% to 10%. Okay, uh, it's not that big a number. Uh, but what this tells you, what, it, what is going on here? Well, one is we're running low on workers. So that creates opportunity for people to work longer. It's also the case that the baby boom generation is the healthiest, best educated group of people we've ever had at this age. And they work in actually not that physically demanding jobs. So, you know, for many of them, it's a good thing. I mean, you know, I, in my department, you know, uh, if you die at your desk, you can carry out most of your work duties for the next couple of weeks anyway uh, before anyone <laughs> really gets concerned. Um, uh, the, uh, and of course, the fraction of adults, uh, you know, who are 55 plus will be uh, over a third in 2060. That's projected to be. So we are really going through this demographic transition. Um, along with this, right, for the first time in 35 years, wage inequality is falling. That important part of that is this demographic scarcity that's pushing up the wages of people who will do the hands-on work. We do not have the young, able-bodied adults who are going to do physically demanding, physically active work. So this shows you, by the way, this is the, the 50th percentile, that's the median, the 10th percentile, and the 90th percentile. And uh, since the pandemic, there's been a reversal of inequality, uh, such that uh, 40 years of, in, of the, the effect of 40 years of rising wage inequality, one quarter of that has been reversed in the last seven years. Will that last? I'm not absolutely sure, but I think the demographics point in that direction. Uh, the college wage premium, again, rising for four decades, now actually contracting. So this is actually a hopeful time. So I, I a couple of years ago, wrote an, an op-ed in the New York Times called Good News, There's a Labor Shortage, uh, and I still feel that way. <laughs> uh, this is good news for the labor force. It means employers are going to have to work harder and invest more in workers. Um, but that's OK, uh, because uh, those workers are worthy of investment. Um, OK, so uh, let me, the last two topics, and I, I'm going to, I, I realize, first of all, you say, well, look, you're hiring for manufacturing. Are manufacturing jobs still good jobs? They are you know, mythologized. Um, the, uh, the, economist, the trade economist Jagdish uh, Bhagwati called it manufacturing fetishism, <laughs> the notion that we fetishize manufacturing jobs. What's so special about them? Uh, you know, computer chips, potato chips, right? It's all chips. Um, the, uh, well, the hourly wage premium in manufacturing has faded. And Ben Armstrong, who will be speaking later today, has documented that in some of his work. And this is recent work by some Federal Reserve Board economists. It doesn't appear very positive anymore. However, the weekly earnings premium in manufacturing is actually still considerable. It's on the order of 15 to 20%. Why is that? Well, it's because manufacturing provides full-time work. And this is a big difference. And that's intrinsic to manufacturing because you want to keep the equipment going. Whereas many people in services, if it's food service, it's retail, and so on, they have inconsistent and rather unpleasant hours, right? And they never know what those hours will be. Um, so manufacturing, I think, is actually, if you look at the annual earnings of manufacturing workers as opposed to their hourly wages, they still continue to have an advantage. And it is much more, uh, and uh, uh, not only can you expect higher earnings, but you can plan a life much more effectively if you know what hours you're working next week and next month than if you're waiting to be on call. OK, so I'm going to conclude. I've spoken about the past and the present. So what's going to matter going forward? Well, I always spend less time on the future since I don't know it as well. I haven't studied this carefully because uh, it hasn't occurred. Um, but let me say the following. Um, the first is, of course, industrial policy. We've been talking a lot about this. It's, it's remarkable how much this has changed. It was just un, that was a word. That was the Voldemort word a few years ago. Uh, now uh, it's the first word in many conversations. Um, I still think industrial policy, as we heard today, people are struggling to say what it is as opposed to what it isn't. Uh, but we're doing it. In fact, we probably were always doing it. We just weren't saying it aloud. The second thing, and this is really interesting, from, from um, Tony Blinken's lips to your ears, foreign policy for the middle class. So we talked about how defense policy is driving a lot of industrial policy. But it's also the case that a lot of foreign policy is by, driven by the sense of the way we improve things in America is by restoring the middle class. And that's bound up with our trade policy and with our investment policy. And investment is a word that we've heard too little of. Right? The US underinvests in itself as a country. Right? We tax too little. We put too little into our people, too little into our infrastructure. And we're less productive as a result of that. And the notion of 
investing, I think, is critical. We will never get, you know, remain ahead of China by holding China back, right? That's just not sufficient. The only way you can get ahead is by uh, moving forward yourself. And the U.S. is doing a lot of holding back. Maybe some of that is justifiable. Maybe some of that will work. But investment is the key. And I think the Biden administration has recognized that. Um, reshoring. Uh, some of that is going on that we are in a different trip here, but as Peter Goodman uh, pointed out in a talk that I saw him give recently, a lot of that reshoring is to Mexico. In fact, it's Chinese companies investing in Mexico to uh, ship goods to the United States. So I don't think we're going to have a mass manufacturing employment resurgence in the United States, but being at the frontier of manufacturing and doing a lot of the workshopping and design here uh, will is possible and would be incredibly valuable. Climate policy is also tied up to this. Uh, a carbon border adjustment would dramatically alter our terms of trade. You know, if there are carbon emission regulations in the United States and they're not in China, that's effectively a subsidy to every product you import from China. The problem with carbon, well, first of all, anything having to do with carbon taxes is very controversial. And then if you, you liken this to a value-added tax, which it is, then that's a third rail for Republicans. But in fact, uh, we would doing, be doing ourselves a big favor if we were to make our tax system actually equitable in the treatment of foreign versus domestic production. Um, immigration, this is going to be critical. So far, no industrialized country has ever rebounded from collapsing fertility. There are little fluctuations, but China is you know, trying to uh, reverse its one-child policy. It's not working. Even in the Nordic countries that have the highest fertility rates of all industrialized economies, they're barely holding the line, right? They're barely at replacement. Immigration will be the key to replenishing our populations. Uh, and there are many, many reasons to favor it, both from the high-skill immigration, where, as we all know, the U.S. leads the world in <laughs> stealing the best and the brightest, uh, bringing them here, investing in them, and allowing them to thrive. And we need workers in every uh, domain. And the last point, of course, is innovation. And it is the case that the United States, from an innovation perspective, remains ahead of the rest of the world. There's a reason ChatGPT was invented here, uh, even Tesla thriving here. So we should... We, there are many things that we do badly. We should also recognize what we do well, even if we don't understand why. And it is the case that the U.S. remains the most innovative economy in the world. The challenge we face is translating that innovation into production. And uh, I'm sure that is a job that you are all going to be working on and hopefully succeeding in in the years ahead. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>